Good afternoon. I'm Chris Fant. I welcome you to Asthma Grand Rounds, and I want to also welcome those who are at home at their desktop who join us by live webcasting, and our colleagues at uh, Mass General and North Shore and Leahy Clinic who join us by live uh, video conferencing. And it's a terrific program, a, a panel of experts today who join us to talk about food allergies. And I'm delighted to introduce a moderator of today's program, Dr. Joshua Boyce, who heads the allergy research program at the uh, Brigham Women's Hospital and specifically is director of the Jeff and Penny Vinick Center for Allergic Disease Research. He's the Albert Sheffer Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. That sounds wonderful to say that. And he is the person who was chosen uh, to chair the expert panel when the NIAID uh, convened uh, this uh, panel to develop the uh, guidelines for the diagnosis and management of food allergies. So a wonderful person to have to guide us through this discussion of food allergies today, Dr. Joshua Boyce. Thanks, Chris. Um, so uh, today uh, what we'll do, I think, is try to highlight some of the areas uh, of food allergy where there is the greatest degree of uncertainty and controversy and difficulties in uh, management. And I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about um, some of these issues to set the stage for our speakers. And since I'm not a food allergist, um, I, uh, I'm pleased that we have three experts today um, to, uh, to lead these uh, discussions. We have uh, Dr. Michael Young, who's an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at Harvard uh, and has a, a long affiliation with Children's Hospital and wrote actually a best-selling book about peanut allergy. Uh, we have Linda Schneider, who's the director of the Atopic Dermatitis Center at Children's Hospital and associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard. And we have Wayne Schreffler, who's the director of the Food Allergy Center at Mass General and an associate professor of pediatrics. So true experts, unlike me, who just plays one on television. <laughs> so uh, to begin with, um, we need to provide an operational definition for food allergy, and this is straight verbatim out of the guideline document. And that is, a food allergy is defined as an adverse health event or effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on an exposure to a given food. It's actually kind of surprising how long it took us to arrive at this definition, but what we wanted to emphasize is that food allergy is not synonymous with a positive skin test or a positive RAST test. And these days when everybody can do food allergy testing, including primary care physicians, um, we have an issue with the specificity of food-specific IgEs and what to do with individuals who get sent to us with 20 positive tests. Are they really allergic or not? Uh, and in the guidelines, we uh, specify that skin prick tests and measurements of uh, serum-specific uh, IgE antibodies to foods uh, to detect sensitization provide a very sensitive means of identifying foods that may be responsible for IgE-mediated food-induced allergic reactions, but these tests have very poor specificity and show relatively poor overall correlation with clinical reactivity. So if they're used alone, they can lead to a gross overdiagnosis of clinical allergic reactivity. So is food allergy really increasing in the United States? Well, there's actually a fair bit of data to back up that it really is. This is from uh, Scott Seisherer's uh, paper that appeared in Jackie a couple of years ago. And Scott has been tracking uh, the uh, prevalence of peanut and tree nut allergy in the US for several years now. And these are the results of uh, surveys conducted in 1997, 2002, and 2008 uh, based on random telephone dialing, so this is self-reported uh, allergy, uh, showing that there seems to be this skyrocketing uh, prevalence of peanut or tree nut allergy um, and uh, really a very consistent uh, time-dependent trend. Since this is a telephone survey, of course, there's no uh, way of validating that these individuals all are allergic clinically, uh, but this data is perhaps a little bit more convincing. These are data are actually uh, CDC-tracked hospital discharges in the United States 
over a very similar time frame to the Seashore study, 1998 up to 2006. And these are hospital discharges of uh, children with a diagnosis of food allergy. Many of these are kids admitted for anaphylaxis. And you see this three and a half fold increase over less than 10 years in the number of hospital discharges for food allergy. And this is why we believe that this is really an epidemic. And we're certainly seeing lots more food allergy in the clinic. So just to describe the guidelines a little bit, uh, the guidelines resulted really from lobbying from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology the year that Hugh Sampson was president. And he lobbied NIAID to sponsor the development of guidelines and to broker the process. And NIAID uh, formed a coordinating committee which had representation from 34 different organizations, including federal organizations, professional societies, and lay organizations. And the job of the coordinating committee was really to oversee the whole process, including choosing an expert panel that didn't have major conflicts of interest and that represented a broad spectrum of expertise and a broad spectrum of representation. The expert panel uh, was comprised of 25 individuals from various specialties, not all of which deal directly with food allergy. Interestingly, there are people on the panel who were specifically chosen because they had experience with guideline development. Uh, and the panel was organized into five major areas and writing groups. And I won't belabor these for the purposes of brevity, uh, but these were the five areas that we thought were most important. The definition and epidemiology of food allergy, the natural history of food allergy, the diagnosis and assessment of food allergy, management and prevention of food allergy, and diagnosis and management of acute severe reactions. So the purpose of the guidelines really was to provide concise recommendations, uh, 43 such recommendations, to a wide variety of healthcare professionals on how to diagnose food allergy, manage it, and treat it and to identify gaps in the current scientific knowledge to be addressed through future research. I'll tell you there are a lot of gaps. Uh, these guidelines are less evidence-based than we all uh, were happy with, and that is because there is a relative dearth of uh, top-notch uh, literature, multi-centered studies uh, in this particular area, something that we're hoping uh, to correct. And another purpose was to identify and provide guidance on points of current controversy in patient management. So with that as a backdrop, we're now going to use case vignettes to illustrate what we think are some of the key issues and some of the most difficult areas of food allergy. And we're going to start with Dr. Young. So Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Thanks. Well, in uh, clinical practice, um, I think you know we get a lot of questions from parents. And uh, two of the most common questions that I get asked by mothers are, number one, my child has peanut allergy. Did I somehow cause this because I craved peanut butter during my pregnancy and ate peanut butter every single day? That's a very, I, I get asked that multiple times every day. The second most common question is, uh, my child, I, I'm now pregnant and um, I'm worried that I might uh, induce peanut allergy in my child. So, so what should I eat? What should I not eat? Should I avoid peanut butter? Those are two universal questions that allergists get asked every single day. And so what I'm going to try to do is, over the next few uh, slides, provide some evidence base of how to answer mom's questions. So the first case vignette is an expected mother, and this is a typical case. Mrs. Smith has a three-year-old son with peanut and tree nut allergy who's already had peanut anaphylaxis. She's now pregnant again and is asking for dietary advice whether or not she should modify her diet and avoid peanuts, nuts, or any other foods during pregnancy and when she nurses her baby in the hopes that she might somehow prevent an allergic baby. So when you review the literature uh, on this topic, looking at uh, maternal dietary restrictions during pregnancy and lactation, um, what is the evidence? And there's a lot of studies out there. Most of them are not that well done. I tried to pick some of the uh, better studies um, and some meta-analyses. And for the uh, sake of brevity, I'm not going to you know, go over each study, but I'll just give you the highlights. So the first study <clears throat> by Lilja et al. is from Sweden. And this was an interventional study where they uh, looked at almost 200 uh, pregnant moms. And they had one group 
of moms eat a uh, significantly reduced milk and egg free uh, diet and the control group ate a lot of milk and eggs. And they looked at uh, sensitization to milk and egg at age 18 months and they basically found uh, no significant differences. Um, the second study <clears throat> is a well done larger study by uh, Zeiger from the Kaiser Permanente Group in California. And he looked at almost 300 um, uh, infants. Uh, during the pregnancy, um, there were strict dietary guidelines for mom where she restricted milk, egg, and peanut throughout the pregnancy. When the baby was born, the babies had a strict dietary schedule of no milk before age one, no egg before age two, and no peanuts or fish before age three. And these patients were followed longitudinally uh, until they reached uh, at least seven years old. Um, so interestingly, um, at uh, age uh, 12 months or less, Dr. Zeiger did find that there was an increase in sensitization to milk, not milk allergy, but sensitization. But by age two to four, there was no difference between the treatment group and the control group. And by age seven, there was absolutely no differences at all. So there was no increase in food allergy, eczema, asthma, or allergic rhinitis uh, with those dietary interventions. <clears throat> the third study is another Swedish uh, study. Uh, this was a uh, prospective <clears throat> randomized controlled study where they also did interventions with dietary elimination of the mothers during pregnancy of milk and egg. And they found that um, there was absolutely uh, no significant differences up to age five when the study was published. <clears throat> um, the last two are meta-analyses. Uh, this one is a Cochrane database meta-analyses, and uh, this is another uh, uh, meta-analyses. And they looked at all the studies available uh, for pregnancy and lactation maternal dietary modifications. Um, this study found basically no differences at all in uh, maternal uh, dietary modifications. This study found that there might have been slight uh, uh, decrease in eczema when there was a uh, dietary modification um, during lactation, but not during pregnancy. Um, so the, the sum is that there's no solid evidence, uh, really, that maternal modification of diet during pregnancy or lactation uh, prevents food allergy. Now, uh, at least with respect to um, mostly these studies were milk and egg. Now, but Mrs. Smith said, well, I'm, I'm really interested more in peanut. You know, so what's the answer for peanut avoidance? Well, there, the studies are a little bit more mixed. Okay, so there are some studies showing that there might be an association with sensitization to uh, peanut, uh, you know, with uh, maternal peanut uh, ingestion. So the first study, and these are earlier studies from the 90s. This is a study from the UK, um, which was actually a telephone survey of over 600 uh, uh, patients, uh, you know, with uh, peanut allergy. And they asked the moms, uh, you know, about their diet. And it did seem like there was a higher uh, uh, risk of peanut allergy in moms who consumed peanut during the pregnancy. <clears throat> the second study is from South Africa, and it was a case control study where they looked at 25 uh, peanut allergic children established by uh, food challenges, and the, the control group were uh, milk and egg allergic patients. And again, they asked mom what they ate, and in this small study, if the mom had uh, peanut more than once a week during the third trimester, there was a higher risk of uh, peanut allergy with an odds ratio of almost four. <clears throat> the most recent study looking at this um, uh, issue is from Scott Sitcher and the uh, Consortium of Food Allergy Research Network, which is a multi-center study consisting of uh, Mount Sinai, Arkansas Children's Hospital, National Jewish, and Duke. And they're actually prospectively following uh, a group of over 500 infants with severe eczema established clinical allergy to milk and egg who are not allergic to peanut. Okay, so if the baby had peanut allergy, they were excluded from the study. And the purpose of this uh, prospective study is that obviously these are children at high risk for developing 
peanut allergy. So they want to see how many of these kids develop clinical allergy to peanut, what are the immunologic parameters, the clinical parameters that result in uh, these kids eventually developing peanut allergy. So what's interesting is that at the start of the study, they found a 69% sensitization to peanut, their peanut-specific uh, IgE was greater than 0 0.35 in 69% of these non-allergic, you know, non-peanut allergic uh, babies who are allergic to milk and egg. So already right off the bat, there was very surprisingly high sensitization to peanut. And <clears throat> they um, then looked at, you know, peanut-specific IgE greater than 5, and their hypothesis was that, you know, over 5, these children were likely clinically allergic to peanut, even though they were not eating peanut and, you know, you can't do food challenges in these small babies. So they did a dietary analysis of the moms uh, by questionnaire looking back uh, over their pregnancy, particularly third trimester, and they asked the mom actually the, how much peanut they consumed during the pregnancy, either no peanut, uh, less than twice a week, more than twice a week, daily consumption, or forget. And interestingly, they found that um, there was a correlation between moms in a dose response according to how much peanut they ate during pregnancy with their uh, peanut-specific Ig being greater than 5. So again, we don't know the clinical significance of that, you know, because these patients aren't eating peanut, they haven't been challenged, so they're just sensitized. But their hypothesis is that, you know, more than uh, a peanut-specific Ig of 5, they're likely to be peanut allergy. So, as these children grow older, we'll have an answer as to the significance of that correlation. But that, so far, is, is probably the most telling uh, study. Um, I think the main issues are with recall bias in that study, but, you know, that, that's an important study which, you know, was not yet published at the time the guidelines were written. <clears throat> so most of the studies in the literature you'll find show that pregnancy is not a risk factor. And again, I'm not going to belabor the point, but these are all large <clears throat> studies that were done uh, examining uh, patients who had peanut allergy and maternal consumption, and they did not find any correlation. The last is a meta-analysis that was actually uh, commissioned by the UK Food Allergy Standards Food um, Agency to really address all these concerns. And this meta-analysis, including a Cochrane database analysis, showed no correlation <clears throat> with um, maternal avoidance of peanut or ingestion and subsequent peanut allergy. So, whoops. What are the recommendations then for pregnancy? Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2008 stated that there is a lack of evidence that maternal dietary restrictions during pregnancy play any significant role in the prevention of atopic disease in infants. And similarly, antigen avoidance during lactation does not seem to prevent atopic disease. <clears throat> the guidelines, um, guideline 36 states, the expert panel does not recommend restricting maternal diet during pregnancy or lactation as a strategy for prevention of the development of food allergy. So that's where we're at at the present time. <clears throat> uh, admittedly, I, I think, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, particularly with the issue of peanut. All right, so that brings us to Mrs. Smith, who now has a baby. The baby is six months old. He has very mild eczema without any apparent triggers. He's been exclusively breastfed, uh, no other uh, dietary exposures, exclusive breast milk. And mom chose not to consume any nuts nor uh, peanuts during her pregnancy. Um, she now thinks that at age six months, um, he's ready to eat solid food. So her question to me is, well, uh, is there any particular order in which we can introduce uh, foods <clears throat> that are considered allergenic? And specifically, when should my child eat peanuts, nuts, and seafood, which are the most highly allergenic foods? So <clears throat> the uh, recommendations from the Academy of Pediatrics uh, were published in 2000 and really not based on any solid evidence, but perhaps based on the Zeiger study that I showed where, you know, he had those very strict dietary guidelines, and he did find that at age one there might have been increased sensitization to milk. Based on probably that study and just, you know, the intuitive thought that, you know, uh, with highly allergenic foods 
and the baby's somewhat immure, uh, immature gut and immune system, uh, exposure early on might cause sensitization. And I think that was very intuitive, but not really evidence-based. So 